Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, bear with me. We've never done an event this size before, so I got this off the internet. Uh, stage four, the keynote. Congratulations, your event is going smoothly and the crowd is happy. Now it's time for your keynote speaker. Before your keynote speaker comes on stage, it's important that the crowd is excited and ready to receive him or her. There are many ways of warming up the crowd. The most common is asking them a rhetorical question that forces them to rediscover their own high level of enthusiasm. One example is asking them if they're ready to see the keynote. Are you all ready to see Bill Nye? Remember that when directing your question to the audience to sound enthusiastic, nothing kills a crowd like monotone. Are you all ready to see Bill Nye? I can't hear you. <laughs> My name is Adam Goldsmith. I'm with the Columbia University Coalition for Sustainable Development, and I have the honor of introducing Bill Nye. Bill Nye graduated from Cornell University College of Engineering in 1977 with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. And then he went to work for Boeing. Uh, he worked in the aeronautics industry about 15 years and uh, found himself drawn to entertainment, where most of us know him from. From 1993 to 1998, he had a hit show that ran for 100 episodes and earned 18 Emmy Awards. Uh, between 2001 and 2006, he went back to his alma mater, Cornell, where he was the Frank H.T. Rhodes Class of 1956 professor. Uh, he holds multiple patents, uh, six honorary doctorate degrees, He's the author of three books, including a most recent one, Undeniable, the Evolution, Evolution and the Science of Creation. It was kind of interesting that, uh, you know, as a kid I watched him and he kind of grew up with me as and uh, went from teaching me science to being an avid warrior for scientific truth. Between evolution and global warming, he is out there making sure people hear the truth. So please join me in welcoming Bill Nye. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Greetings, greetings. Greetings. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, it's great to see you all. I was, um, I was really excited about this talk until uh, just a couple minutes ago. No, somebody came up to me and said, uh, is Bill Nye your real name? <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, well, it's William Nye. It's William Nye. Well, why, why did you change it? <laughs> well, uh, we're going to be here for a while. No, greetings, you guys. I just, uh, I am, uh, am uh, tr going to try to give you some perspective on nuclear energy based on my own experiences. And uh, you will hear, of course, my own opinions, which are correct. <laughs> and uh, this huge time saver uh, in describing this business. But uh, for me, our story begins with my dad, who wanted to, my dad went to Johns Hopkins, which is an OK school. All right. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to marry a woman that went to Goucher College. Now, Goucher is a liberal arts school now in Towson, Maryland. Uh, used to be in the city of Baltimore, and back when we had such things, I guess we sort of still do, it was the, uh, Goucher was the sister school to Hopkins, not unlike Barnard and some other uh, school in New York. And so, am I going too fast? Okay. Now, when you get a degree from Barnard, it says Columbia on it, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, her father would not let them get married until she was graduated from college. So my dad had what seemed like a good idea. He wanted to make a lot of money quickly, wanted to get a nest egg up for his bride. So he took a job on Wake Island. I don't know if you've ever heard of Wake Island. 
you go to Hawaii and then you go about that far again, another 5,000 nautical miles into the Pacific Ocean, and there's this very small atoll, coral reef thing, and uh, it's tactically very important. You would, if you were a business person doing business in Asia, you would fly from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor, refuel in Pearl Harbor, and then fly from Pearl to Wake, refuel in Wake, and then fly on to Midway or Shanghai or one of these places. And <clears throat> uh, at the, when the thing started, uh, the only way to get there was by seaplane, the famous Boeing Clipper, very sexy uh, uh, Art Deco looking plane. And my father and the crew were building an airstrip. So he was a construction worker, but he was the college kid. He was uh, the quartermaster. He, was, he did the accounting or something. So nobody thought, really, in the spring of 1941, nobody thought that the Japanese military would attack. That's ridiculous. Come on. There's no such thing as climate change. Come on, that's crazy. And so everything was cool in the summer of 1941, but I don't know how familiar you are. It was December 8th on Wake Island because of the international dateline. That was December 7th in uh, Hawaii. And so uh, Pearl, uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed and Wake was bombed the same morning. Wake Island was bombed. And these guys fought back for two weeks, uh, but they were eventually captured by the Japanese Navy. And most of them were taken to prisoner of war camp in China. Oh, look, if you guys get a chance to be a prisoner of war, I just, I don't do it. That's, uh, that's what I got out of that. So uh, you guys, this is the, I think this is an extraordinary story and it's just stuff that happens. My mom was, the woman who became my mother, was graduated from Goucher College in the spring of 1942. And her boyfriend, her man friend, had disappeared. These guys on Wake Island, nobody knew what happened to them for months. They did not have any radio. They did not have the internet. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> no Facebook or Twitter. Yeah. No internet? <laughs> Bill, what did they do all day? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's disturbing, isn't it? Just thinking about it. So, the, sec the dean of students at Goucher was a woman named Dorothy Stimson, who happened to be the first cousin of the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. By the way, in those days it was called uh, the Department of War, not the Department of Defense. <laughs> We're defending our oil fields in the other side of the world. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well. You guys, I, I'm serious. I don't know if it would be better or worse. I really don't. But I think things would be different if we were to change the name of that organization back to the Department of War. I just think it would give people a real perspective what they're really, what we're really up to, and what it really means. So apparently Henry Stimson said to Dorothy Stimson, do you have any women that can come work on this thing? I can't tell you what it is. Did you guys see the imitation game? Very good looking, to Benjamin Cumberbatch, very good looking. Anyway, my mom was recruited to work on the Enigma Code. My mom was in the Navy. She was a lieutenant in the Navy. She subscribed to Cryptography Magazine. After 1992, when they were allowed to get it, they were declassified in 1992, 50 freaking years after the, uh, they were recruited. And uh, you would, they would be at parties. I met several of the women over the years. What did you do during the war, Dorothy? Oh, I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a big deal. So I mention this because, according to my mom, there was not really an ethical question when uh, it was, the atomic bomb was developed. Should we drop this bomb? Is this really ethical? Drop it, man! I get it over with! The people were just terrified of the Japanese military. They were, Japanese soldiers had a reputation to fighting to the death, which apparently was very well deserved. And people in the U.S. were scared that this thing would go on for five more years. And my dad hardly ever talked about his experiences, but at that point in the war, as Japanese uh, influence shrank, they were moved to the island of Japan, southern island of Japan. And uh, 
he tells a story about this guard who was 15 years old at this point. All the adult guys were gone. They were, the Japanese guys were gone. And he drew a circle in the dirt. It was a big bomb. It was really big. And the commandant of the prison camp killed himself, you know, seppuku or whatever. It was a big deal. So nuclear weapons, as you saw, I'm sure, in the film, I hope you got this one, have been tied very closely to uh, nuclear energy for well, ever since the whole thing was figured out. And another story that I just think is just so amazing, the most romantic story I know has to do with the atomic bomb. Uh, is everybody, has anybody ever heard of the Compton effect? Oh, yeah, Bill, what? Is there anybody who took physics? One guy, okay. The Compton effect. So Arthur Compton uh, discovered that um, you can steer electrons just like waves, just like waves of light in the Compton effect. Anyway, he was a young guy at the University of Chicago, and he was recruited to work on the Manhattan Project to make these nuclear weapons. He's a mathematician, I guess. And he arranged for his wife to get security clearance. And it's quite expensive. I had security clearance for a while. And the FBI comes to your neighborhood and they ask your neighbors, you know, has he been spending a lot of money? You know, does he do drugs? Is he a communist? And stuff. Anyway, so General Graves, who was in charge, the army guy in charge of that project, took, apparent, according to legend, took Arthur Compton aside, you know, dude, I'm not sure he said dude, it was 1942. <laughs> Arthur, you gotta get to Los Alamos, you gotta work on this matter of national security, let's go, 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 go. And besides, dude, why do you want security clearance for your wife? We got work to do, you know. She is, back in 1942 terms, just your wife. You know, what does she know? So anyway, Arthur Compton said, I just wanna be able to talk things over with my wife. That, that gets me. I just want to, he didn't want to have to keep secrets from his wife. But this tradition of secrecy has played havoc, in my opinion, with our perception of nuclear power, and furthermore, the way the nuclear industry presents itself to us on the outside. Now, if you don't know the premise of the bit, as we say in comedy writing, the premise of the bit is you dig up this uranium, you clean it up somehow, then you fish in it, it gets really hot, crazy hot, and then you run a steam generator just like you do with coal or natural gas or oil. You just run a, just, you run a, a huge heat engine that spins turbines at very high speed and you make electricity, big fun. And then the premise of the bit was, well, when we're done, we'll just put it back in the ground. This will be great, fabulous. Anyway, uh, when I was a kid, we went to Heckinger's Hardware to look at a bomb shelter, which we were going to build, and we filled bleach bottles. These are Clorox bottles with water for when the nuclear weapon was exploded. We'd just go downstairs and wait it out. Everything will be fine. Uh, anyway, it turns out, as you may know, to be fantastically more complicated than that. And then another just amazing story did... Um, have you guys ever heard the expression, the cross-section? So it's a, a cross-section, you're familiar, you cut a log and there's the tree rings, but they use this, physicists use this to describe how to get neutrons to bump into other atoms as though they have a cross-section, as though they have a, a width. You know, we all think of atoms and neutrons and protons and electrons as particles, which is a really very good model, but you know, it's, it's like nature. And maybe they're not really particles, and that's just how we think of them. But at any rate, uh, they use the term cross-section. It turns out only about 0.7% of the uranium has the right cross-section. And you may have heard this expression, uranium-235. It's 92 protons, and all the rest are neutrons. Then most of the uranium, the other 98.3%, uh, is 99.3% is uranium-238, has three more protons, uh, three more neutrons. All right, so it was Niels Bohr, who was at lunch, and apparently he figured it out, and he got up from lunch, and he ran into the, or walked quickly to the blackboard, and he drew the, what they needed to do to realize, all you gotta do is take the uranium ore and put it in fuming nitric acid, 
and some, uh, I guess, uh, hydrofluoric acid, and then you can make uranium hexafluoride. Simple. The most deadly freaking stuff <laughs> there is. And you may have heard people talk about the centrifuge and all the controversy about having centrifuges in the Middle East and so on. So the cool thing about fluorine is it only has one isotope. It, doesn't, it only exists uh, with the, always has the same number of neutrons. So you can spin this stuff in a centrifuge really fast and uh, the heavier stuff goes to the outside and then if you're really skilled and careful you can get the lighter weight stuff, literally lighter weight, lower mass stuff, closer to the middle. And then there's several other processes and you can enrich it from 0.7% good stuff to up into the 80s, 84% good stuff. And that's the stuff that fissions, that, that gets hot on its own. And so uh, it's extraordinarily complicated. Now I was the, uh, I was the uh, MC of the, of the Department of Energy Science Bowl for a couple years. As, um, it's the coolest job. Because what you get to say over and over, this may only appeal to some of the people my age, over and over you get to say, here's the toss-up. And, uh, oh, God, here's the toss-up. It's just the greatest. And I'll just tell you, the people, the kids, the high school kids from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, are just butt kickers. They're so smart because all their parents are a bunch of physicists and chemical engineers. and all. Like, uh, here's the toss-up. What meat? <laughs> Rubidium? Uh, uh, is right. It's just, there's, anyway, the, it's so complicated to get uranium to where it's fissionable that it makes it different, really, from other types of heat-fired turbines, like um, coal. You burn it. It gets hot. I got it. I'm there. I got it. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a fluidized bed which we use in coal plants, you turn coal into like flour. It's so fine. And then they spray it out uh, into a furnace that's all on fire all the time. And this greatly increases the efficiency of coal-fired plants. But it's still just burning coal. There's no uranium hexafluoride and fuming nitric acid and all this stuff. So uh, the complexity of it has really been troublesome. And the secrecy that was required to develop these processes that allowed uh, the United States especially to develop the first nuclear weapons. This stuff is still with the nuclear industry, this, this secrecy. Now with that said, the US Navy has a lot of nuclear reactors. In fact, I'm not sure exactly how many there are. If they told me, they may have to kill me and so on. But they're very good with it. They fission the stuff in the conventional way, get it hot, and they run steam turbines, they run submarines and aircraft carriers all over the ocean. Uh, and it was Admiral Rickover that realized that nuclear power was the way to do this. You wouldn't have to continually refuel ships, which was a cool idea. But they have the luxury. When the reactor is old, they just take it out of the ship and bury it, usually in Idaho, our beloved Idaho. And, uh, and that's good. I mean, uh, you can bury it, you know, for a long time. And are there any Idahonians here? It's lovely, but there are a lot fewer people there than there are in other parts of the world. So leaving it there is okay. Now, <laughs> no, really, I mean, it's okay. People, uh, if you're a terrorist and you're willing to drive to Idaho with a bulldozer and think you're not going to be detected, I mean, you know, knock yourself out. I mean, it's just it probably won't happen. Uh, but I have been to uh, Hanford, Washington. Now, I know people back east haven't really heard of Hanford, but you've heard of Los Alamos, right? That's where they built the first nuclear weapon. Well, Hanford, Washington, which is in the southeastern part of the state, is where they developed plutonium, and uh, or invented or created the first plutonium, and that's where they made the hydrogen bomb, which relies on fusion instead of fission, like we have in the sun, and have in all the stars. And so. It's, uh, it was a secret place, and they have been, just for me as a former, I lived in Washington State for 26 years, uh, they have been really bad <laughs> at handling their waste, uh, not uh, stuff from the washroom, stuff from uh, nuclear activities. And it's not, it's not the men's room or something, it's, more, it's extraordinary. 
And the problem has been the waste itself is trouble. I mean, the radioactive stuff is trouble. But there's all these rubber gloves and booties and coveralls and all the stuff and all these solvents that were used to wash things and get them pure enough and stuff that are just buried in these casks, in these oil drums. And it seemed like, when I lived there, it seemed like every week there was another news story out of Hanford. Uh, then you probably heard about uh, Three Mile Island, and Three Mile Island almost was a big problem. Can I use the term big problem? Uh, I don't think it's appropriate to drop some other words here. Uh, but it was a big mess up. Uh, and it almost, it almost you know, created enormous trou trouble. It's Harrison, Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania. It's right at the end of the runway. It's right there. It's not hidden. It's, it's right there. It almost blew up. Then Chernobyl did blow up. And then um, Fukushima is still trouble. I mean, the film mentions that the things in a containment vessel, the thing, the nuclear mass of molten metal goo is in a containment vessel, but it's still unusable and it's fantastically radioactive and they're trying to set up this muon detector and it's just not working, but the longest journey starts with a single step. The problem in each of these three accidents is not, to me, is not really inherent in nuclear energy. The problem is, if I may, it's Homer Simpson. The kind of people, you'll hear it from the nuclear industry. All these guys will say, well, they shouldn't have been doing that at Chernobyl. That was graphite. They should have no, but they did. <laughs> well, they shouldn't have built that Fukushima plant on that. Well, they did. <laughs> so when it comes to trust us, I am, you know, Mr. Skeptical Man. Now, uh, uh, there are, right at any time in the world, there are about 800,000 oil wells. If you want to reckon it in offshore oil rigs, it's a little over 3,000, 3,100, 3,400 offshore oil rigs. When one of those messed up a couple years ago in the Gulf of Mexico, people in deep water horizons, people were like totally freaked and demanded that something be done right away. Well, right now, there are 432 commercial nuclear power plants. There were 433 till Fukushima. Anyway, just wait till there are 43,000 or 14,000 nuclear power plants. There's going to be another accident. There just will be, because it's humans. It's not, it's not um, uh, this idealized bunch of people running the things. There will be another accident. So we just have to say to ourselves, is that worth the risk? Can we manage the risks? And this is where I want you, as voters and taxpayers, to kind of figure that out. Now, uh, I've been to Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And you guys, look, you don't have, this is not rocket surgery, okay? <laughs> You're at Yucca Mountain, it's a tunnel in a ridge, way up a, a hill, a big mountain. And you go over on the parking lot to the railing, and there's a, a stream down there a couple, a couple hundred meters. Like, it's way, way above the water table. So you're telling me, that in the next thousand years that no nuclear stuff is going to get in the stream and go to Las Vegas? I mean, come on, kids, dude, dude. <laughs> and Yucca Mountain was largely a political thing to just trying to get something done uh, to keep the nuclear industry going. But if nothing else, everybody, nobody in Nevada wants it. Nobody in Nevada wants nuclear waste put there because of all the experiences they've had with Trust Us, where we know what we're doing with the nuclear industry. We're going to do this at Yucca Mountain. And then you go out there, you go, dude, dude, this is never going to work. Have you heard of Alloy 22? Alloy 22, the key. It's going to be the stainless steel. That's it, that you can buy it. It's a Hastelloid thing. Uh, it was supposed to be corrosion resistant for 10,000 years. Dude. Dude. Now, in the movie, you saw them point out that the conventional uh, nuclear plants, light water reactors, as they're often called, have produced waste that's dangerous, like the Navy produces waste that's dangerous for 10,000 years. Hey, wait, we've got a new one that's only dangerous for 800 years. Okay, what? 
800 years, the Roman Empire, which was pretty much a butt-kicking government, all right, it did not make it 800 years. What, I mean, just everybody, just get it in perspective. When people are talking about having dozens and dozens of nuclear plants that are going to do something safely for 800 years, just, do you think the United States is going to be here in 800 years? I mean, will it be the Federation with Captain Kirk flying around? I, you know, I don't know. But it is, it is a haughty thing to uh, imagine, to, it is hubris to imagine that a society can do that. With that said, you know, maybe, maybe we can. Maybe we can produce uh, power uh, in a way that's good enough. Now, uh, by the way, uh, when it comes to nuclear waste, as I say, there's a lot of trouble with the, the ancillary or secondary waste, but also you know, in Paducah, Kentucky, where they did the uranium, uh, uranium hexafluoride and stuff, they had all kinds of solvents, you know, PCBs, uh, polychlorinated butyls and uh, trichloroethylene and uranium dust on stuff. Uranium dust. I mean, you know, it's just not your first choice. <laughs> so you have to have something really hot to make something spin, but you have to have something cold. And the expression is a cold reservoir. So the way I describe this, uh, if you had a tea kettle and you boiled water in it and then you had a a pinwheel or something, a, a turbine like that, and spinning, hoo, 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 and then you connect it to a generator somehow, and you make electricity cool or hot, and then you're out of water. You're out of water, so you add more water, and it blows again. Okay. Well, then you go, you know, I'm tired of adding water. In fact, you have to shut it down to add water because it's under pressure, right? You can't just put a funnel on it because the steam would come out of the funnel. Whoa. So you have to shut it down to add water. So, okay, I got an idea. We're going to we'll make a duct a tube that goes around the turbine and comes back over here, back into the tea kettle. Cool, this will be great. So it works for a few moments. The boiling steam goes, eh, spins the turbine, goes up to the thing, back in. But after a while, it just, it's a thought thing, thought experiment. The kettle gets really hot. The duct gets really hot. Your little pinwheel gets hot. Everything gets hot and under pressure. <laughs> and the pinwheel stops. You follow me? Without a difference in temperature between hot and cold, it won't spin. And when you're, next time you're in a cab, you'll notice that the outside is colder than the engine, which is about, uh, well, typically 1,000 Fahrenheit, 600 Celsius. And so uh, you'll find, actually, if you design uh, fuel injection systems, cars are more efficient on cold days, strangely enough. So, these power plants in Washington State were built on the Columbia River. Now, if you guys live back east and stuff, I gotta tell you, it's a whole nother thing. The Columbia River is a huge freaking river. I mean, it's, it's just an enormous thing. We really don't have anything quite that big back east. Mississippi is pretty big, but anyway, they were gonna build six power plants along here, and the idea is you have this nuclear fuel getting hot, and then you cool it with the Columbia River. Anyway, because of the controversy of nuclear waste and all the trouble people have had at Hanford with all the secrecy and the low-level waste, they only built one of them, they only finished one of them. Columbia Generating Station is Washington Public Power Supply number two. And it's cool, I've been there, it works great. You know, these guys running the stuff, there it goes. And um, uh, they have security. There's people with machine guns standing around. But if you really wanted to break in, I mean, I'm not an expert, you know, I'm not Bruce Willis or somebody, <laughs> but you could do it. And if you had a confederate inside who was really wanted to get nuclear material out of there, given a couple years, you guys could set up a raid and you, it really, it's, you could do it. It's, I mean, there's guys with uh, AR-16 machine guns, but you could, you'd get in, you'd have a, I don't want to tell you how, but <laughs> I'd recommend, a, a personnel carrier that can go across the prairie. It's a prairie in eastern Washington. And you just plow right in and you know, pick the guy up with his suitcase full of stuff and cause trouble. Uh, uh, but the, the casks that were described in the movie, they're there. I mean, they're there. And they're, they, you could hold the Geiger counter right up next to them. Cool. It's good. But, you know, 
uh, their casks above ground full of nuclear waste and nobody really has a plan exactly what exactly to do with them. They just keep piling them up. Now it may be that uh, this traveling wave reactor, this fourth generation will do it, but I'll give you an example at the Washington State, at Washington Public Power Supply number two, Columbia River Station, uh, Columbia, Columbia Generating Station. They've estimated the earthquake risk. Now I lived uh, in, in Seattle for many years and in 2002 we had a pretty good earthquake and my chimney broke loose on my house. And this, you know the expression, a ton of bricks? This was about three tons of bricks. And uh, it was just teetering. The, the, it, was just, it was just like, like that. I went up on the roof on a ladder and said, like, whoa, whoa, dude, dude. And so I tied it to the another side of the roof and then, is anybody here a bricklayer? How do you guys, it's just, uh, there's an earthquake, all these brick buildings in Seattle break. 4,000 bricklayers show up. Hey, I'm here. Hey, cool. And they, they knock the whole thing apart. Anyway, in Washington State, it's in the West, it's geologically young, there are earthquakes. That's all. They estimate the chance of an earthquake uh, at Columbia Power Station it to be 1 in 147,619. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of significant digits, <laughs> but that's crap. I'm sorry, you can't give me five or six significant digits and make me believe it. I'm sorry, you guys. I love you all. But it's part of the, the tradition, the nuclear industry, of just telling you everything's okay, and I'm skeptical. So, uh, finally, uh, about the next generation nuclear reactor. You know, the premise is to have uh, a fissionable stuff like uranium-235 in the middle, and then you would have this other stuff that's left over, uranium-238. People in India and places where there is more thorium in the ground for mining, people propose using thorium, which is another radioactive material that's not as powerful as uranium, but you could set it up. And the idea is, instead of having the stuff fission like this, you'd have it fission like this, and then you'd have this gizmo, or these robotic arms, the conveyor belt, that would continually move the fuel to the proper place. But the premise is to get plutonium in the middle. Plutonium-239. That's the stuff. Now, <clears throat> No matter how you feel about plutonium, I will tell you this story. I was at the California Science Teachers Association in 1994, and I had lunch with Glenn Seaborg. If you've ever heard of Glenn Seaborg, atomic number, uh, atomic element number 168 is now called Seaborgium. Does anybody here have a Nobel Prize? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, so did he, so did he. And uh, he was the guy, or one of the guys, that invented or created plutonium. And I was having lunch with him, and he's just a charming guy, well in his 80s. His wife is just cool. You could tell they had a, they had a good thing. It was really good. And he says, Bill, uh, Bill, they wanted me to call it plutonium. <laughs> but come on, plutonium, that sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Glenn, yeah, it does. <laughs> and then he told me they wanted, by long tradition, they wanted the atomic symbol to be PT. Uh, uh, for plutonium, but he insisted, Glenn Steborg told me this to my face, it's hearsay when you hear it, to my face is how we talk in junior high, to my face. <laughs> he said, I insisted that the atomic symbol be PU, because this stuff stinks. <laughs> it has, some of it has a half-life well over 10,000 years, you know, in a substantial fraction of a million years. And he said at lunch, it's, it's the heaviest of heavy metals. You bear in mind, uranium's a metal. Thorium, these are metals, you know. Uh, they're like gray, if you see it in pictures. Anyway, uh, he said if you breathe just a few micrograms, breathe micrograms of plutonium, it'll kill you. Like arsenic, it'll replace the phosphorus in your DNA and kill you. So it really is dangerous stuff. And the premise is to have a robotic machine that moves this stuff around without any failures for 60 years with plutonium in the middle. It may work. It may work, but as voters and taxpayers, I just want to give you that perspective. Thank you very much.